Right, so uh, I have a typical task, which is to change uh, page rather completely. Uh, and you're going to see what looks like uh, uh, rather a theoretical piece of work. So um, I'm going to describe a few facts, and they're facts that, to some extent, Kathleen guided us to. Uh, this is a team, Joe Briggs, uh, myself, Daniel Martin, and Chris Tonetti, who might walk in in a few minutes. I expect he will. Um, and the topic is uh, the change in the nature of what used to be called retirement. Uh, and so, I mean, Kathleen kind of requests that the HRS change its name to, to the health and late in life, whatever you're doing, uh, uh, study. Uh, 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 um, and so what this is, is taking off on that, and then the modeling got to be its own particular pleasure. Uh, so you'll see that we went a little haywire, uh, and we've delivered a model. Uh, some facts at the beginning, a model, and then a wish list about measurement. Uh, we actually have a good opportunity to me for measurement, which I'll describe. All right, so uh, the key to this is the idea that jobs are not just wages. Uh, they are wages and non-wage characteristics. And uh, the conjecture that while that always matters, it might matter particularly at, toward the end of life when somebody might have uh, that's me. Uh, somebody might have changed preferences somewhat, and in the end of the working life might be interested in things that weren't just making money for them. They might think about, you know, do I enjoy this work? They might change what they like. They might have a search phase, and a rather complex search phase, of, with a bit of churn. So we're imagining now, and this is, in fact, it is a fact, that there is a stage of life post what's called the career job, which has a bunch of bridge jobs, and that the typical model of retirement, which is you kind of drop off and finish your job and you're gone, uh, is not valid anymore and increasingly invalid. Uh, and technically, what we're going to do is allow, in the model, exploration of the quality of a match before acceptance. And so people are going to put some effort in to understanding an offer they receive because we presume they're having a hard time judging the non-wage characteristics. They may accept jobs. That might be a bad idea. Uh, and you're going to see that work through a model structure. Uh, what I'm going to do is first tell you why we were motivated in this direction. Uh, uh, and here is, um, uh, we've done some additional work on bridge jobs. Now, it's known from the HRS uh, already that uh, there are a tremendous number of people who, after a, lo a long job that lasted some 10 years, at least 10 years, go through a phase which they don't immediately exit the labor force. There's evidence that many take one or more short-run jobs after the end of the career job. And the first thing we're going to do is go a little bit beyond the existing measures and expand. I mean, uh, Nicole's done a great deal on this. Uh, do a great deal, to a little bit to expand even uh, our knowledge of the number of people doing this by looking at jobs between waves. So the HR, the main place that you measure uh, the fact that there are um, there's churn at the end of life, uh, whoops, churn at the end of uh, a career job is to see in that, in the waves, successive waves after a career job that uh, they are in a new job. And then maybe in the next HRS wave they're in a new job again. But that's typically measured just at the wave itself. Now in the HRS there was information on between wave behavior. And I want to point out to you what this tape is going to show is that when you take account of the additional information in the HRS on between wave behavior, that you get a change and an increase in your estimate of the number of people who are going through this rather complex exit process 
from the labor force. They're not just exiting in one go. Uh, in this data, we find that, uh, by the way, there is Chris sneaking in. Uh, we won't let him do that. Okay. Um, I call for Chris. Um, that uh, we have a lot of people in the HRS who have a career job while being observed. Uh, taking the group here, we have about 6,000 individuals who would have a career job. Uh, what happens is that uh, we see that about 70% uh, of them um, exit at some point, and we're going to consider and are observed again in the HRS. They've left their career job, but we see them again. Uh, of those, if you use the standard HRS, you'll find that there's some subsequent employment for 42% of them. 58% of them don't have subsequent employment. So at least 42% are doing something other than just exiting. Uh, I can just tell you quickly that when you add in the between wave employment, you up that number. You go back to the original HRS, take a look. Uh, Joseph has boldly gone where few dare go, which is back to the original files and see, uh, add in that additional data you wind up finding that here's the easier way of getting the switch. If you look down and at, our, at the table at the base there, uh, when you measure between, uh, at the wave, you find that 58% of people did not, uh, don't show any evidence of a job after their career job. That shrinks to 50% uh, when you look between waves. Uh, and the percent that had at least three jobs in the post career job phase goes up from 10 to 18 percent. In other words, you just simply take 8 percent of the people, switch them out if we didn't have a, uh, anything after the career job, and it turns out they churned a lot. So there's certainly some churn going on in this phase, and we're going to allow in a theory uh, that uh, this is because it's hard to know your match to the job. And you might take a job, we're going to look at the supplier of labor who might take a job, uh, feel a little bit of regret, and then quit. And then look again, and then quit, and that's going to be the behavior we'll model. And uh, it's, what we're going to do is add rational inattention to an otherwise standard search model. So now I'm just going to tell you something about modeling technology. Uh, this is The rest of this is almost entirely about modeling technology. Uh, what we're going to do is put together a, a Diamond, Mortensen, Pissarides model of job search in discrete time. It's going to be, uh, we're going to do it, what I'm going to present to you is an infinite horizon model, even though the one that we're ultimately going to be applying will have a finite horizon, which involves a few wrinkles. But the model has its own structure, and you have to respect its structure, and that's what we're doing. We just built the model and see what comes out of it. What's going to happen is that uh, firms are going to post job offers, as in the classical model. They're going to, a wage is going to be visible. The other characters, characteristics of the job are not visible. What the worker is going to have to do is think about what exact type of job is in front of me, and do I think I'm matched with that. After doing some work, investing attention in this, they will take a job if they think it's good enough. Uh, if they think it's good enough, they will then quickly learn on the job whether it is, in fact, good enough. And if it isn't, they'll leave. And if it is, they'll stay. That's the structure of this model that we're developing. Uh, and uh, firms, we're going to trivialize as much as we can. They're going to be zero profit machines uh, that enter. And uh, what, the, what the offerer of a, you'll see as I describe it, um, the job offers are going to be complex, wages are observable, non-wage characteristics are hard to assess, uh, and we're, um, okay, let me just go to the model. I think I need an equation. Uh, I'm feeling all uh, in need of something that gets you to the model itself. Uh, we're, we're going to have workers uh, who are going to be looking for jobs in the class, in the classical search model. Uh, we're going to have free entry of firms who can wash, offer jobs. It's an infinite horizon. The jobs will pay W. Jobs can be of low or high type. So what's going to happen here is people are going to accept bad jobs, ones they shouldn't accept. 
The benefit to the firm is they've got somebody on the job for a period. They can make some money from that. The benefit, uh, and they supply worse amenities. So what we're going to have is some, some bad jobs available for an older worker and some good jobs available for an older worker. They'll have to sort them. And that's going to be the fundamental force at work here. Uh, uh, workers themselves in the model can either be unemployed or working in a low-type job or working in a high-type job. Uh, they would much prefer working in a high-type job. Uh, the firms would uh, get more profit if they offered a low-type job. Uh, they have to post, the firms have to post job offers. Uh, there's a search cost. Uh, there's a match probability. It's all looking very standard. It's time more simple to read these models. Uh, uh, um, all the choices are standard, the workers are Bayesian, I better move on. I don't think I have quite enough time to describe the entire slide. I uh, hope you can forgive me, Chris, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, uh, we're going to have ex acceptance. I want to give you the new element before you, before you, there is a new element. Okay. The new element in the model isn't here. Uh, this is a st somebody who is employed, who gets either to stay uh, or to quit and become unemployed. The new element is on the next decision, which is going to be unemployed. An unemployed individual can either stay unemployed, and that's the left-hand side, utility of unemployed, and then they discount and they get be unemployed again next period to start with. And then here's the rather interesting term, the supremum over something or other of an n function, uh, which says uh, is going to be where rational inattention is going to come in. What's going to happen is somebody is going to invest in clarifying the nature of the job offer in front of them. It's a model of due diligence. That is to say, it's assumed that understanding exactly what a job is is not easy. In this model, you will not be able instantly to tell your match to this position. You will have to think about it, ask friends, talk, see how miserable the people are on the job, etc. We won't model the exact signal that you get. Instead, we'll allow you to do anything. And this is where the rational inattention framework shows its virtue. Because it's a model which allows you to undertake any attempt to learn at cost. It is difficult to learn, and that's going to be reflect what we're going to describe your attempt to learn. First off, if you have an offer in hand, there's a certain unconditional probability that you'll accept it. But it's different conditional on whether the job is high or low, or low type, with that difference reflecting the amount of work you did to separate out ahead of time whether this was a good or a bad job offer. So you're going to have to do work ahead of time. That would have PA sub H diverge from PA sub L, because you would like to be able to accept the high job offers, but you won't do it perfectly. You're going to pay for improvements in your ability to discern by the Shannon cost function, which, can, which is basically the entropy of the expected entropy of the posterior less the entropy of the prior beliefs. So you can spread apart. And if you accept a job, it can be more likely good. If you reject a job, it can be more likely bad. The gap between them, you pay for, because that's your learning. We're not going to describe the activity. We're going to describe the posterior that you end up with. The nice thing about doing that is the posterior that you end up with is the thing that goes into the value function. So when you're thinking about how to optimize, you end up with a value function, which is going to have these gammas, which are posteriors, in them. So if we just go through it, this n term has three parts. I never know where to stand when there are two of these. I'm just... <laughs> uh, there's expected value of employment. That is the first term. I may receive an offer, alpha w. Uh, P, I might accept it. Then I sum up over how likely it is if I accept it as of either type and the value if it were of that type. I add to that the expected value of non-employment. That is to say that I would um, uh, in, be unemployed 
if I didn't receive a match, didn't accept it, or didn't search. And I would pay costs according to this term over here. So this is the thing we're going to be optimizing. Uh, this is part of the value function. And I can just tell you that there's this really neat solution. Uh, that rational inattention model with dynamic programming has a really neat solution. I don't know how else to describe it. You go through, you imagine a two-period model. You get rid of all the dynamics. Think of a two-period model in which there's a certain reservation wage. And you write down what it would be acceptance would be like in that world, or rejection would be like in that world. These are the W functions. They're a little bit of a made-up thing designed in the end just to help you solve the model. They're just a, a, an aid. This is with an E that you don't know. That's a new parameter you've added just because you feel like it. It's fun. And then you transform payoffs in a strange way that's all to do with Shannon. The Shannon model has some strange transformations that show up and suddenly make the model soluble. From that, you can actually get in closed form the probabilities of acceptance of the jobs and the posteriors associated with the jobs, which enables you to go back and you can substitute in and decide whether to search or not by looking at a, an equation that as a function of E tells you whether to search or not. And in the end, the way you solve the model in this dynamic program is by making sure that you have get set the reservation wage, this E thing, correctly. And that comes down to a theorem that you can uh, find something called reservation expected utility, which is a level of expected utility that of, a, of a job that will just be good enough for you to believe that it's worth accepting. What will happen then is immediately after the event, you will maybe find you made a mistake and quit. But so in other words, what's going to happen is you f there is, instead of reservation utility, there's reservation expected utility. It's not a reservation wage. There's uncertainty that's left. There's nevertheless a number, the expected utility, that's good enough, that should it turn out that when you're on the job, you get a reward a higher than that level, you will stay. Should it not turn out to turn out as less, you will go. So now you have exactly your optimal strategy worked out. The, uh, and this is a characterization of one part of the model, but that's just the, uh, that's just the module that relates to the searcher. So now I'm going to take you through a little bit more of the model technology. Uh, and show you that we can also get the other side of the market to work. Now, how's that going to happen? Uh, so, by the way, this is just everything about the worker problem and the answer. You can't read this any, at this speed. It's hopeless. Uh, but you can understand that we've produced what we needed to from the worker side of the model. The workers have worked out their strategies those strategies are going to get fed across to the other side of the model, and we'll see how we close that. We've got their reservation strategies. We've got their attention strategies. Subject to some parameters. Those parameters are things like the, the fraction of good and bad firms. And we're now going to show you how, in equilibrium, that gets determined on the other side of the market. What's going to happen here is that we have firms that can either offer a bad position, keep you for one period because it will be noticed that it was a bad position, and you'll then quit. But they made pretty good. They have lousy amenities, so they did well that year. Uh, and the other side of it is the firms that offer you good jobs. Uh, they unfortunately have to pay more for to supply the good facilities. Uh, they benefit because you're willing to stay. So that's, uh, those are the two firms, and each of these firms works out, makes profits. And the correct equations to look at says, look, the profits for a firm, they have to post their vacancy. They may or may not, alpha F, have a, alpha F is whether or not a worker will match with them. If the worker accepts, and that they'll accept, with the probability of acceptance of that particular type job L, 
and then there'll be some per period payout profit. Uh, there's an equivalent for the high type firm, except this time they have a longer run with the worker. So there's a one minus beta, one minus delta in the denominator. The key is, and why would I bother telling you all this if I've ex accepted right ahead of time that you can't understand it at this point. Uh, I'm doing it because I want to point out to you that there's a very nice connection between the supply and the demand sides of the market in rational inattention models. Very unexpected to us as we played with it. We didn't know this would happen. The rational inattention model gives you a strange condition on posterior beliefs, that they have very nice ratio properties. And it, you can set those equal to the, the relative profits of the firms. And what you're then doing, because if you see the F equation, both of them, the zero profit conditions, connect something that you found out from the rational inattention model is nicely behaved, which is a ratio of posteriors, to something that is very neat because it's the zero profit condition on the supply side. That's the key to driving through the model, throwing in a Diamond, Mortensen, Pissarides matching function, uh, involving telling you how many match, how many offers each will get as a function of the volumes of un unemployed workers and the mass of vacancies, which gives you law of motion for unemployment. Uh, big equation, uh, but it's it's uh, just a flow system. Uh, you can get a law of motion for vacancies. Um, this just all works out. Steady state conditions, uh, market clearing, and what we can tell you in the end, and then we're going to impose rational expectations, we can tell you in the end that we're looking for an equilibrium in which everybody is happy and everything is in balance and supply and demand are meeting and we get an unemployment rate out of this, we get a vacancy rate out, we get the masses of firms of different types. We get how, you know, basically, how bad is this market from the viewpoint of the searcher? How many mistakes will they make? Because it's a model of mistakes. We get the, the proportion of mistakes in equilibrium out of this model. And uh, it comes down to one equation in one unknown. So you've got this large <laughs> model, which looks like it isn't going to crack any which way, and it turns out to be one equation and one unknown, which is the model builder's pleasure. We kind of, it's, it's fun, uh, and it is workable. So it's workable to the extent that we can start illustrating how the model works. Uh, one of the times the things you can do is to increase how difficult it is to learn. Lambda is a multiplier on the difficulty of moving from a prior to a posterior. It's a multiplicative cost factor. If you increase how difficult it is to learn, not surprisingly, what tends to happen is that uh, there are mu, uh, the probability of the firms being good goes down. There's more bad firms around. Uh, and you get uh, uh, lots of corresponding changes in how well you do discriminating and the types of mistakes you can and cannot discriminate you make more mistakes accepting the bad jobs. Uh, you can do comparative statics on reservation utility, uh, increasing, sorry, increasing the utility to a high type. You can all do all those comparative statics. We're in the early phase of this. Um, what we're currently doing is moving from the infinite to the finite model, uh, because that's the one where we're going to describe this as the end of life cycle phenomenon. And in the end of life cycle phenomenon, the easiest way to describe it will be that there is, you go for the high wage job when young. This is a bit of a fantasy. Uh, a little bit later, uh, you decide that maybe that job was too onerous or you have change in preferences, you'd like to move on. The career job ends or you get, frankly, get booted out, but we're not calling it that in the model. Uh, then you have to start searching. Uh, and what will happen in this model is that you'll search 
You may or may not get a good job. You may or may not get an offer. If you do get an offer, it may be a bad one. You'll quit and you'll try again. What you're going to get is phenomena such as job churn and endogenous early retirement for those who had a disappointing uh, meeting and their first job was bad, they're out. So what you're going to get is a bunch of post-career job churn and uh, depending on how exactly you model the turnover in preferences. Now, uh, what we'd like some feedback on, the model is uh, well in place. We have one opportunity that, um, uh, to do measurement that will maybe uh, expand on existing data sources. So uh, it is the Vanguard Research Institute panel, which some in this room uh, know a great deal about, is a new panel that we have uh, put together uh, with Vanguard and the uh, University of Michigan. So Matthew Shapiro and John Amritz are very involved. Uh, and it is a survey of about uh, 9,000 uh, um, Vanguard um, uh, shareholders, uh, because everybody at Vanguard is a shareholder. Uh, and uh, we are able to ask them, we have their basic wealth measures, um, and we could do a classical employment survey and ask about various features of employment. But we also have the right to ask them other questions that we think are relevant to the fitting of a model like this such as to do with their job preferences. So Nicole's been developing a scale or some scales that have to do with what, would you, what are you seeking later in life. So we think we could add some, a small battery of such questions to understand the preferences. We'd also like to understand features of the search behavior and uh, how, um, uh, you know, where are they looking? What, what have job disappointments been? Even some of those who didn't get jobs, it is understood that it's more likely that, that the 50, it's about a 50-50 split between those who do work post-career job and those who don't. But among the, for desire, it might easily be two-thirds, one-third. There are a lot of people who, who leave the labor force at some later point think they might like to go back. I have no idea how many frustrated people there are who say, actually, I was searching, and there was just a bit of a problem. Um, uh, so it is very much work in progress. You can see I put you through uh, some slides with symbols that flew by you far too fast for you to take in. Uh, but at least our motivation should be clear. Uh, as you can see, the modeling is in many ways well, well advanced. Uh, what we're currently doing is um, developing surveys related to this. And the other thing that we're rather keen on is understanding the contrast between this model and a model in which uh, there is difficulty matching, finding out, but you can't put any upfront investment in to, um, uh, to reduce your uncertainty. That's where we're at. is the new chairman of the economics department. Thanks for So, Doug, do you mind if we put this on you real quick? Yeah, it's fine. Great. <clears throat> and you won't have to press any buttons. I'll do it all quick. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Andrew, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry we, we didn't warn you that this being steeper, the projectors actually aren't designed to handle that many equations. Uh, we kept our fingers crossed and they, they didn't burn out. I actually was tempted to just produce a slide that was covered with dense mathematics and say, well, this is my first comment. Uh, this is self-explanatory. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Um, in any case, uh, <laughs> over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, there has been uh, an explosion of interest in 
the topic of attention to information and the implications of attention and inattention for economic decision making. That's gained a lot of traction within macroeconomics with the work of SIMS. It's also been a topic of considerable interest in behavioral economics and Andrew has played uh, a major role in some of that. Uh, it has potential applications to a wide variety of problems and here uh, rational inattention is being used to understand what the authors call due diligence in search models. Uh, where there's hard to discover attributes of the uh, things that one is searching over. Um, and the particular application here, of course, is uh, to job search. Uh, in making that application, the agenda being pursued in the paper certainly uh, breaks new ground topically. And I think that methodologically, uh, it has the promise to be quite influential because what they show is that you can take this extremely complicated system and uh, just through um, coincidences that we don't quite yet understand, uh, it turns out that it has this miraculously simple um, representation and can be reduced to a single equation and a single unknown. Um, so my comments are mostly going to focus on the application of, uh, of this to the uh, job search topic, job search among uh, older workers. I, I have to confess at the start that I haven't had uh, much time to uh, go over this paper. Uh, Andrew promises me that I will get a copy of it by tomorrow at the latest. <laughs> um, so I've had enough time to go through and uh, formulate some questions. And actually, uh, they are yes, uh, yes and no questions, really. Uh, so this simplifies Andrew's response. Uh, when you come up, you can just go uh, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, and, and you'll be done. Um, so uh, I'm going to pose some of these questions in a skeptical way. Uh, but I want to emphasize that I don't know the answers to any of these. Um, I, I'm asking them primarily because I think that providing clearer, stronger answers to them would help people understand uh, the um, implications of this, the importance of this, uh, and broaden its influence. So um, here are, I'm beginning on the questions here. The first question uh, is, do older workers really value the non-wage aspects of jobs more than younger workers. This is a premise of the model. This is one of the assumptions. And there's some evidence that's offered on this point. The evidence speaks, in my, to my mind, rather obliquely uh, to the issue, and certainly only speaks to narrow dimensions of the issue. I, I don't think we really know whether this is true more broadly or not. Um, Older workers can certainly face a lot of financial pressures that would make them very focused on wage. And I listed just a couple of them here. Uh, you might have kids in colleges. Uh, if the kids are done with colleges, they might be starting out. You have to cover weddings, help them get into their first homes and all that sort of thing. They, these people are also coming up to retirement. They may look at that for the first time and discover that they're not well prepared for it and all of a sudden the pressure is on. It's also well documented that phenomena like divorce leave a large number of people uh, finding themselves all of a sudden within a decade or so of retirement with their retirement plans thoroughly disrupted and they need to focus on um, uh, on the finances. So there's lots of reasons why older workers may be extremely concerned about these financial dimensions. Younger workers, depending upon their life stage and their career stage, may be interested in other stuff. They may be more interested in the social aspects of their work environment. Their friend networks may still be in flux. They may have lower financial needs if they haven't had kids yet. And if they do have kids, they may be more interested in non-wage aspects of the job, uh, like uh, flexibility with respect to hours and so forth. Um, so it is not obvious to me that um, older workers are systematically different than un younger workers in this dimension. At least it seems like there should be an implication here for which older workers and which younger workers have volatile employment based on their life situation, things like their wealth and the number of kids and the, 
the stage and whether kids are in college and so forth, one should be able to derive cross-sectional implications, which the data might speak to in an interesting way, although there's probably a lot of confounds in looking at that cross-sectionally. But that's, that's one thing that I think it would be worthwhile to look at. So that's the first question. The second question, is there really much scope for due diligence in job search? Now, I think many of us, we think, yeah, of course there is, because we think of our own job search. We think of the junior faculty job market, for example, where you, you go and you visit the university and then you call people and you talk to them on the phone. And of course, things like that exist in a lot of other professional fields. It exists for uh, people starting out in law firms and consulting firms and so forth. There are things you can access on the web, uh, polls and information about which firms are good and which are not and on what dimensions. But that's kind of concentrated, at least as far as I know, in um, the more professionally oriented fields and particularly at the entry level positions. I'm not sure there's much scope for that sort of thing uh, when you're talking about somebody taking a job as a bagger in a grocery store, for example, or taking a lot of the other kinds of positions that the people who were interested in when we talk about this age group and the volatile employment experiences that they have, those kinds of jobs, exactly what is it that they're doing in their due diligence. Um, the, the paper, um, I think, uh, tries to shore this up a bit and provide a practical foundation by using some language uh, that suggests that uh, we ought to think that practically these sorts of things do go on, the language being due diligence. Uh, that's a familiar real phenomenon, right? But there's a couple of problems with that. The first problem is that um, due diligence is usually not associated with job search or taking jobs. It may be when you get to the upper end of the professional ranks, but we usually associate it with mergers, brokerage, shipping, things like this. Second, actually due diligence conjures up the wrong phenomena for me. Remember, due diligence is a legal term and its origins are um, uh, from the legal sphere. Um, it, uh, its meaning is essentially, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a term that's used to indicate whether a party took reasonably, reasonable care to inform themselves uh, and others uh, before taking uh, certain actions. And so, for example, the purpose of, of having a due diligence standard can be to protect oneself against a lawsuit. Uh, if you're in a position, of, for example, of being a broker and you're making a recommendation to someone else, you're supposed to take due diligence so that if it turns out that uh, the recommendation was bad and the investment goes bad and they turn around and sue you, you can say, well, it went bad because of information that I could not have reasonably known. I did due diligence. So you sort of did a CYA operation. Uh, and that's the function of it. It also flips around the other way. Um, you know, if you're buying something, you will do due diligence so that if it turns out that the investment is bad uh, and uh, it's because uh, of some information that the other party claims you should have known, you can say, well, no, actually, I did my due diligence and I didn't come across that information uh, because you uh, concealed it from me. So when we talk about due diligence, we're really, to me, it's conjuring up very different motives for um, searching for um, information. And moreover, due diligence is a thing in the law precisely because it's so frequent that people don't do it. And this model is basically about people doing it of their own accord. So, you know, this is a roundabout way of asking, what really are these activities in this context? What is this due diligence? What does it consist of for the jobs that the rank and file take? The third comment here, or question, is whether there are other natural explanations for the motivating facts. Um, remember, the motivating facts here are that after transition out of a career job, the volatility of employment is higher that there's a lot more job switching at that point. And it seems to me that there are other possible causes of that. So one possible cause is that people, when they get to that stage of their career, have stale skills. 
that are not as valuable in the job market, harder to find matches for those. They may have less incentives to invest in long-term relationships and therefore establish stable relationships with employers. There may be less opportunity for successful implicit agreements with employers because the horizon is shorter. I mean, I just jotted down a few ideas that I came up with in a couple of minutes. I'm sure that there's a lot of explanations or potential explanations for the motivating facts here, and I'm wondering why this theory rather than the other theories that we could have written down if we were writing this paper about something else. Okay, fourth question. Is rational inattention really the, the, the right modeling framework for this? And I have a bit of skepticism here that relates back to the question that I asked before about what information people are actually uh, being assumed to acquire in this process. What is the due diligence process? What are they learning and how? So the things that come to mind and that you actually mentioned uh, in your presentation uh, involve chatting with other employees, okay, talking to people who are there. You can spend some time doing that. Um, and, and thinking about that, my, uh, my, my immediate question is, have you ever checked out econjobrumors.com? Because that's kind of like chatting with employees. And it mostly consists of misinformation. Okay, so the question that I'm led to here is, you know, is it right to think of this through the lens of rational inattention, or should we be asking the question, can people filter the information um, from the nonsense? Um, a related question is whether uh, they suffer from known biases that are going to affect that process. For example, there's some good evidence that people believe in the so-called law of small numbers, which of course is not a mathematical law. Uh, it's just something that they believe in, that they generalize too much from a small, ob small number of observations. So you talk to these one or two employees and you generalize from that and say this is the norm. Uh, that would be a false inference. Um, we also know from some work in neuroscience that experiences get tagged with uh, valences from people's visceral reactions to things and, and that that influences their decisions. I, as I was thinking about this, I was uh, conjuring up a different application of the model, which is to kids, uh, kids meaning uh, teenagers finishing high school, 18-year-olds, uh, deciding on which college they're going to go to. And they do college visits. And this is their due diligence, right? It's like they go to the college, they talk to the students there, and so forth. And I don't think for a minute any of that involves rational processing of information. It's sort of, you know, did I have a good visceral experience that day and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk to some other students that seemed friendly and stuff. I, so, so in my mind, I think some of the interesting questions here actually have to do with the likely biases that are going to be expressed when people gather that kind of information. Fifth question, um, are due diligence and rational inattention really important for the main results that we're looking at here? It's not clear that they are. And, and let me explain why. I understood, at least as I understand it, as I understand it, the main idea here is that there are these unobserved features of jobs and older people care about them more, okay? Why isn't that enough all by itself to explain the basic pattern of increased volatility uh, of employment? In other words, uh, these people, they, they can't tell there's no way to tell what the, uh, the non-wage features of the jobs are. So when they take the jobs, there's higher risk that it's going to be a bad match, and so they have higher probability of, of uh, uh, leaving that job and, and searching for another one. It's not clear that one needs to introduce the information gathering part in order to explain that basic pattern. So I am left wondering, what patterns here are we tracing to all of this wonderful apparatus that's you know taking so much to develop that adds all the complexity to it. One could have uh, departed from the uh, uh, Diamond Mortensen Pissarides uh, world in a much smaller way and simply said that there are these uh, 
hard to observe characteristics uh, that some people care about more than others. And it seems to me we would have gotten the main implication. We would have explained the basic facts. So I'm not sure what the rest of the machinery is adding to this particular application. And then finally, one final point, one final question, is uh, whether the model is sufficiently general. Um, let me explain what, what I mean when I ask that. Uh, so again, th th this model has some really amazing features. It is a highly, highly complex system that has ultimately a remarkably uh, elegant and simple solution. But plainly, you don't get that for free. Right? If you just wrote down everything's arbitrary functional forms, you'd never get anywhere uh, near that. So where does the vast simplification come, come from here? It comes from the Shannon cost function. Right? That's, where, that's what's doing all the work here. Now, Andrew and I had a conversation uh, a couple of days ago where he was sort of running me through the ideas of the paper. And he made the comment, which I said I was going to quote him on, that uh, and I, this isn't an exact quote, but it's uh, Shannon costs are to the theory of inattention what uh, the Cobb-Douglas cost function uh, was to um, you know, economic theory in the 1960s. And that's kind of true on a number of levels because you know it's got this, the Shannon cost have this log structure that makes the scale invariance that simplifies everything and helps the two sides match up and so forth. But if you follow that analogy through and ask, you know, for that work in the 1960s, the Cobb-Douglas stuff, did it turn out to be kind of special and not general? Well, yeah. I mean, it turned out that it can be very misleading in a lot of situations. So the same question, I think, needs to be asked here about the structure of the Shannon costs. And it's possible to address these questions, even if you can't solve the model analytically, by doing numerical simulations with more complicated versions of the model, just to explore uh, the robustness whatever you of whatever you find. And I encourage you guys to do that. So concluding, I just want to emphasize, again, that these are questions that I'm posing here, not really criticisms. I don't know uh, the answers to them. And whatever the answers turn out to be, um, I think that this agenda has already made impressive pro progress in showing that it's possible to um, solve this di difficult technical question that could turn out to, to offer important uh, practical insights, not just for this application, but for many other search applications as well. Thanks. Um, so the motivation for this was this between wave churning in the HRS. And when I looked at those data, the thing that kind of struck me about those jobs that are kind of beginning and ending between waves was that they, they were at very, very low earnings, you know, like a few hundred dollars here, like annual earnings. And so my interpretation of those jobs was not so much, you know, like looking for a job I really want and then discovering something's wrong with it and quitting, but that they were more like odd jobs or second jobs or short-term consulting arrangements. And so I'm wondering if you have any, any more sense of how you're thinking about that. Well, the, the motivation for this is much more the general phenomenon of, of. several uh, experiences post. Uh, it, it, this is just a... That was just an adding, illustrative example. Just a little, uh, just a little bit of yeah. additional. There's a little bit more churning, uh, and I agree that a filter could be applied to say this was not uh, serious. I don't know which ones that would account for. Uh, how many? There were. Can I take a few of Doug? Take a shot. Sure. Some of that. Yeah, only got uh, six uh, Like I said, yes, yes, uh, no, no, yes. <laughs> uh, is the model sufficiently general? No, I'd like it to be more general. Uh, um, the, 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 way, the way I think uh, we see this is that there's something about going straight to the posteriors without describing the information that, again, looks like what we did with production functions and looks like, which, I, which has virtue in what we did with utility functions, which we go straight to whatever it is that we could observe from it, which is where we see that when you take this job, you turn back 70% of the time. So that proportion, the fact that you tend to turn it down so often, will be the data that says, yes, you've got some information, but it wasn't quite good enough. 
So we, we really want to implement. Now, a lot of the, a, a lot of the other questions, I, I don't know. We don't know. And I think we'd love to know how to measure. That's to say, I think that the part of this that really excites me is, OK, so there are phenomena, and there are certainly a very complex. I mean, I think the, there, are, there are phenomena that you wouldn't really put in your head if you hadn't asked. I th these things about uh, at later years, you care about mixed age group workplaces. Like these are, these are phenomena that I wouldn't necessarily have known were going to be among the key attributes of a job. And we have, certainly in our sample, the sample that we're going to ask, the people will be choosing. It is to say we have relatively well-to-do people. And some of it will be I have a social mission. And I always missed out on that in my main job. And I'd like to do something to give back or something like that. There is going to be quite a lot of that going on with the group, one of the groups at least, that can be interviewed. Um, but I don't know how general that is. And, I, and certainly, our feeling is that this modeling component is just the ex ante phase of diligence. And I agree that in the legal interpretation, uh, we might have got it backwards. But it's too nice to play on words. Not the <laughs> We're not, I'm not giving it up. <laughs> May I speak? You may. Okay. Um, one empirical fact about older workers leaving career jobs is the incidence of being self-employed is much greater. This diamond this really is, um, model, this model is really designed where parties are both employers and the employees, not workers, potential employees are searching for a match. Um, I think it, it, it takes um, a slightly different form when it's going to be uh, a of a temporary arrangement between a self-employed worker and a customer when he deals directly with the customer without the intermediate employer. So, you, um, so, so this might be Way understudied. I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting phenomenon, uh, which is the bridge uh, through self-employment. I think that uh, it's fascinating. I don't know where it fits in, but I think it fits increasingly fits in. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, the question of what it is that you don't know when you set out on that, and if you decide to do some investigation before committing to it, can, can also show up there. So. Um, you and then Doug question, do older workers really value the non-wage aspects of jobs more than younger workers? Does it really matter in terms of the comparative issue? Isn't the real question is to what extent do older workers value the non-wage aspects of jobs? And leave out some of the comparative aspects of that question. I, I, th um, I, I think the, I think the notion of the career job, I mean how you get there to be something called a career job is interesting in the model. And in the end, that career job, it might just be the horizon that it was long enough, but something has to happen that ends a rather long tenure uh, and takes you into a period of search. Now, what Doug said was, in fact, we could have got various of the features of this model in qualitative terms by saying you can't do anything up front to investigate the non-wage characteristics. You've got to show up on the job, you take the job, and then you get. Now, we enjoy opening that margin. So we say, there's something you can do. Uh, and, uh, but, but then the question we'd love to know, we'd love to kind of measure that. So could we, is it worth it in this to kind of try and find out the steps that were taken between, well, you could be here, but you know, find out what it is before you say yes. Uh, and, and so that's the that's kind of the modeling do, and measurement question. Do we know whether there's um, 
kind of almost a symmetrical churning before you land the career job. Yes, there is, and that's typically modeled uh, by the Jovanovic model. Uh, and in the Jovanovic model, or variants of it, it's all about learning your productivity. So it's a, a one-dimensional search. In fact, the uh, search, the labor search, which is one of the other reasons to do labor search, the labor search literature has been very one-dimensional. There's a W. The W is visible. And there's a reservation W, accept or reject. So it's really downplayed the idea that there was something maybe that you could have done. And so the Jovanovic model gets around that, says, but it still says it's a trivial characteristic. It's just the W path. And you don't know your W path, but there's nothing you can do to help learn ahead of time. So we wanted to open that margin where, well, maybe you'll invest in finding out, and that itself will be unpleasant. Um, I suspect the answer to Doug's first question, to older workers value to non-wage aspects, uh, depends on which end of the spectrum you're looking at. As we'll see tomorrow in my comments on Bob's paper, the likelihood of using a bridge job on the way out is higher at both ends of the wage spectrum, socioeconomic spectrum, however you want. And the folks at the top end, when you ask them why they're still working, they say, I enjoy the work, I like my colleagues, I like to make a contribution. They're basically saying because I want to. They're often financially secure people who are doing it for non-wage reasons. But of course, at the other end of the spectrum um, are, John, or, are the baggers in the groceries, uh, uh, people who are working because they have to. And my guess is um, they're not they're there for the pay, they're there for the health insurance, and so on. So you could have a very different yes, answer for very different people. I, th I think that the, the point about the young versus the old is important, right? Because there's nothing perhaps wrong with the Jovanovich model for young people because they don't know what they're good at or how good they are at it. So the one-dimensional model may make perfect sense. But then you say, can that possibly explain what's going on for old people? And, well, not really, right? Because they should know a lot about what they can do. So it's got to be sort of something else, right? So. I, I, I think that the survey is exciting. I would, I would sort of encourage you to, I don't know, you know, maybe not tie it so closely to this paper, this model, but rather go into it with a very, sort of uh, Doug's, I guess, third question here. You know, what are, the, what are all the things it could be, or at least a, a set of plausible things it could be, and go to the survey with the notion of looking for evidence on those things. I mean, it could be that, you know, your health just changes more quickly, right, when you're older. So, and that could mean that the job that fit you fine for 25 years you know, now you sort of need to change more often because, you know, sort of you're changing physically or whatever. Could be a lot of things, and I think it would be great to get that kind of evidence. I don't know what you're gonna learn about the low end from a Vanguard survey, um, but you know, that's, that's the way it is. Nothing. Well, right. Other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Thanks,